how many of you have either read the book, um, The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, and or saw the movies, any of the Narnia movies, right? Okay, so in the movie, you have Aslan, who is a talking lion, who is a picture of Jesus. And he has a special relationship with a small girl named Lucy. And in the second movie, she's looking for Aslan everywhere, but cannot find him. And then suddenly, she, she, uh, he shows up, and she is both bewildered, uh, you know, enamored, and also terrified to a certain extent. He said, you're so much bigger than, than you were the last time I, I, I saw you. And she was thinking, well, I'm bigger, so the lion would be, my, you know, keeping the same perspective. He would be smaller. But then he says something very important. He said, because the bigger that you get, the bigger I get. And what he was saying there and what God is saying to us tonight is that he does want to grow us up so that we can have a bigger perspective of who he is. Hear me when I say by the word of the Lord, this is going to be a year that if we are not on our knees, if we are not in prayer and intercession, calling upon the kingdom of heaven, bringing the kingdom to the earth, if we are not operating in the grace of God, There are trials and challenges that are coming that we are not prepared for. And I'm not speaking woe or disaster. This isn't conspiracy. This isn't anything else. The, the, the message tonight is not to freak you out. But God is saying he wants to draw near to you. He wants to give you a supernatural power and wisdom that you yourself do not possess so that you can get the answer before the problem even arrives. And Lord, I pray that for myself, for my family, for this church, God, that you would widen our capacity to receive you. Lord, I pray that you would uh, uh, cause our vision of you to get bigger. Help us to see more of you. Lord, I pray just like John the Baptist that you would increase and we would decrease in the name of Jesus. And so today, uh, as I was just talking to the Lord, he gave me a very specific word for us here tonight. For those of you that don't know, we as a church, uh, we do a fast at the beginning of the year, every year, uh, because it sets the tone for the year. Because we don't want to just have a word where we're excited. We're saying, God, we need you. We want to humble ourselves. We want to put ourselves into alignment and without doing a whole teaching on, on fasting tonight, fasting isn't about hurting yourself so God feels sorry for you and you're manipulating his behavior to move on your behalf because you feel so bad. That is not what fasting is. Fasting is saying, I'm going to deny my fleshly appetites so that I can come into alignment with you. Fasting does not get God to align with you. Fasting gets us to align with God. And it's in that place where we receive grace, power, wisdom, and more importantly than all of those things, we get more of his presence. We get to know Jesus. See, Paul said something that doesn't make sense to most of us, especially here in America. He said, I want to know the power of his resurrection. Now, we can get behind that. I, I, I love to see when Jesus rolls away the stone. I have seen God physically raise people from the dead several times. And again, I've said this, so, I mean, we, she even wrote a book about it, raised my wife from the actual dead twice. I, I love seeing that. But he, Paul doesn't just stop there. He doesn't just say, I want to see, the, I, I want to know the power of his resurrection. He also said, I want, also want to know the depth of, of his suffering. Paul even wrote about himself that he did more than all the other apostles, but it wasn't him. It was the grace of God working in him. He did three circuits around the known world at the time, planting churches all around. Most of the New Testament that we have is actually letters to those churches. And so Paul was extremely productive. My life was completely changed, not just by the Gospels and, and by Jesus, obviously, but also by the writings of Paul 
uh, there's a lot of things in there that really uh, help to shape my perspective and help me to get into more alignment with God. And so Paul did see the power of Jesus' resurrection, but it came at a cost, and the price was the depth of his suffering. Paul writes and he says, look, I've been uh, beaten with 39 lashes. They say 40 will kill you. So they would remove one. They basically would take you within that close to dying. He said, I've been beaten 39, with 39 lashes three different times. I've been stoned twice and left for dead. I have been in hunger. I've been shipwrecked. I've almost drowned. He says, but in all those things, I don't count this light and momentary suffering to be anything in comparison to the glory of God that will be revealed, not only in and through my life, but for eternity. When I go before Jesus and he says, well done, good and faithful servant, and he starts giving me the crowns of life and I take them back off and lay them at his feet. And I get to spend time with him and behold the one that I love for all eternity. He says, I can endure the physical pain. No, it's not comfortable. No, it's not fun. No one wants to say, hey, beat within an inch of your life. Sign me up for that three times. You know, this ride was fun. Where do I get the tickets? Like, no. But what Paul knew is that he says, whatever situation I find myself in, wherever I feel that I am led by the Holy Spirit, I know it's going to be worth it. He even said, death works in me so that life can work in you. The problem is, is that we do not have a focus on uh, sowing seed in other people's fields so that they can be fruitful. We're just eating our own seed. And so as we are about to go into this fast, you know, we, you can follow along on our website, kingdomculturecc.org. We have a church fast tab that's on there. Uh, there are two posts in there already uh, just about preparing for the fast. And every day, I'm going to try to get it out at 6 a.m., but every day we will have a new post for that day. And so we're going to be talking about a lot of different things that the Lord is placing on our hearts of, of points of prayer and intercession and even warfare, uh, of, of seeking God and drawing close to Him. But if I could sum all of that up, is as we are going into a fast, it is to uh, deny our flesh and selfish nature so that we can get in alignment with God, the one who says, love God, love people, make disciples. And tonight, <clears throat> the Lord gave me Isaiah 58. Now, if you are not familiar with that chapter, this is one of the most important uh, chapters in the Bible. Because it is talking about God's perspective on fasting, and it's very different than, than what a lot of us would initially think. I know it definitely changed it, uh, my perspective and challenged me quite a bit. And the reason why I say this is important is because Jesus said, when you fast, don't be like the hypocrites. So he's, fasting is not optional. If you want to follow Jesus, he even said, if you want to be my disciple, you need to deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. Jesus did not create the church so we could get together a couple of times a week, sing some songs, get inspired and go home and live like nothing happened. He came so that his kingdom would come and will would be done. He came to confront, to destroy the power of sin and death, to free us as his people, fill us with himself and his spirit so that he can walk with us, so that we can be light in the darkness. Jesus did warfare on the cross, and he's calling us to that same warfare in our lives today. And we cannot, and please hear me, you cannot walk in the fullness of who God has called you to be without this discipline of fasting. There are many times when we go through our spiritual walk and we hit a spiritual wall. 
That's a good time to start fasting. There have been many times when I've needed a, a word from the Lord. I needed wisdom. I, uh, there was a sin in my life that I couldn't break. Uh, uh, there, there were strongholds or thought patterns or spiritual attacks from the outside, spiritual attacks on the inside. And each time when I get into prayer and fasting, the Lord strengthens me from the inside. See, what fasting does, it is not, uh, you know, putting yourself at a point of pain to show God how great you are. What it is, it's saying, God, I need you more than I need this other stuff. And that's really it. You know, Job had the uh, heart of fasting, and he said, Lord, I have desired your word even more than my necessary food. And so we get into Isaiah 58, verse 1. It says, cry aloud, do not hold back, lift up your voice like a trumpet, declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sins. Now let me stop. See, there are some people that are already rolling their eyes saying, you know, every time I come to church, they just want to point their finger at me. No, you need to understand the nature of God. Yes, he loves you, but he is also holy. He wants to draw near to you, but if you draw near to him in a state of unholiness, he will at some point have to judge you. And what he's saying is, I want you to draw near without all of the judgment. And so I have already dealt with the sin on the cross. As long as you are in a place of confessing your sin when it happens, that I'm inviting you now to not just ask forgiveness for your sin, but also receive my strength, wisdom, and grace so that sin no longer has a hold on you. This is what it means when it says that Jesus came, it was for freedom that he set us free. When he, it says on the cross, when he died, he led captivity captive, and then he gave gifts to men. And so when he's saying declare to the people their transgression, because a lot of us, we want God to judge them for their sin, but our sin, we're just like, it's not that bad. It's, you know, it's fine. I can't believe what she said about me. Girl, let me tell you about her, though. And we think that's okay. And what God is saying is, no, very first step, if you want me in your life, if you want to ha experience the power of my Holy Spirit, if you want the God of the breaker anointing to come through and break down the walls that are preventing you from moving where God is calling you, he says, it starts with this thing called repentance, and let's get real about your sin. God says, I will make the way. I will do what you can't do. What can wash away my sin? What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. He says, I got you. But first, we got to get real about what's going on. You have to see and admit the cancer so that I can cut it out. Instead of smiling and pretending like everything's fine. This is what Jesus calls hypocrisy. He even accused the scribes and the Pharisees. He says, you're whitewashed tombs. You look great on the outside, but you are rotting on the inside. And what Jesus is saying, when he's talking about, tell them of their sins, explain to them their transgressions, he's saying, let's get real so that we can get real past this. He says, I desire for you to be clean. I desire you for you to be holy. I desire you to experience life, and not just surviving, but life more abundantly. But first, we got to deal with the stuff no one's talking about. Verse 2, it says, yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways. Now, before I finish in ver verse 2, I want you to understand, it sounds like these people are doing great, but you need to understand the implication from verse 1 is they're doing all of this stuff without a heart of repentance. They are still harboring their sin and trying to hide it and thinking that they can still go to church. And, 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 and I'm not saying you can't go to church if you have sin in your life. Of course, this is where we need to go. But we have a tendency to not want to come. We, you know, we, we're fine with coming to church as long as we don't have to come to God and deal with our stuff. And so it says, Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the ju judgment of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. But then they say, Why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast, says the Lord, you seek your own pleasure." 
Peter echoes this in, in his uh, letter to the church where he says that, you know, you have not because you ask not. Or when you do ask, you spend it on your own pleasures. And it says, and you oppress all your workers. Verse 4, behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight. How many of you have ever gotten in a fight with your spouse when you're fasting? Yeah, yeah, I could tell you some stories. We'd be here all night. <laughs> Thank God for grace. Love you, babe. You know, because what, what happens when you're fasting? You get irritable. Everybody getting hangry. And then you got two hangry people. I mean, you, you look left a little too fast. Bap, you know. And just the smallest thing will set you off. And the thing is, is that God does not call us to a fast so, to irritate us so that we can fight with one another. God calls us to a fast so that our immaturity and selfishness will come to the surface so that we can deal with it in him. Because what happens is, as Adina and I, in the past, when we've gotten into the, that, those intense fellowships, especially, fa- it's like up here, but then the fast fights, yeah, you don't know that's a thing. It's this thing. But in those times, we've learned how to humble ourselves before God and for each other. And now there are times, especially when we go into a fast, we pray and we cover ourselves and we even have a little conversation, probably going to have that conversation tonight, about, hey, we're going into a fast. We need to show each other extra grace because whatever we're fighting about, it is not worth it. I love you. I'm for you. I'm with you. This is going to be rough at times, but God is good. And it's not, it's, you know, I'm going to love you through it and I'm asking you to do the same for me. Amen? Amen. But a lot of times when we're fasting as a religious exercise or we're fasting because we think we're doing it the right way, but we're doing it for our own purposes, when when that flesh, that hunger raises up, we have a tendency to lash out to whoever is around us. And unfortunately, it usually lands on our spouse, our kids, our friends, and it's not okay. And so, it says, Will... uh, Uh, Verse 5, is such the fast that I choose, a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed? Is it to spread out sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? God's saying, I'm not calling you to a fast so that you can show everybody how pitiful you are. He's like, this isn't a time to bow your head down. It's a time to look up. That a fast is not about what you're feeling, it's about getting what you're feeling out of the way because the just walk by faith and not by sight or by what they feel. And so in a fast, you start feeling everything you were feeling before the fast times 10. The heat gets turned up. But here's the thing, when we cry out to God, he gives us a grace that is turned up to 10 to 12. He says, my grace is sufficient. See, the Lord says that he will never allow you to go through any temptation that is too much for you, that you can't overcome. But when the temptation comes, he always provides a way of escape. And when we hear that word temptation, we think that means, oh, to to do something we shouldn't or to look at something we shouldn't or or to take something that doesn't belong to ours. And and all of those things are, are valid, but also it's the temptation to raise your voice a little bit louder than you should in a respectful way. It, it, it's also about uh, being, being short or, or, or irritable with other people. And so as we get into the later part of this verse, you will see that God's desire is that we be kind to one another. See, Jesus said the entire Bible, the entire law and the prophets can be summed up in these two commands, love God, love people. You learn how to do those two things That's what the rest of the 66 books are about, is to show us what that looks like. And so, he says, is this not the fast that I choose? So we just went through a little bit of what fasting from our perspective can look like. Now God is saying, this is what fasting is from my perspective. To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and to bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? 
What God is saying, this is the fast that I desire. You put your own self away and start looking out for the needs and interests of other people. Verse 8. See, I love that. So God first off says, look, declare to Jacob and to the house of Israel their sin. For those of you that don't know, Israel means one who contends with God. But before his name was changed to Israel, the historic figure that all the nation came from, his name was Jacob, which means usurper. Before his encounter with God, when his name got changed, his whole life was all about deceiving, manipulating, and trying to take other people's stuff that did not belong to him. And so when God calls Israel Jacob, he's saying, yes, I love you, but right now I am not happy with you because you are acting like a usurper. You are not acting like one who is working with God to get things done. You are acting like a child who is on the floor throwing a temper tantrum trying to get their own way. But then he says, all right, so here's what the fast should look like. Here's your perspective. This is what the heart should be. And then now that we have discussed that, now he's showing you this will be the consequence of that. This will be the outcome or the product. In verse 9, uh, or sorry, verse 8, then your light shall break forth like the dawn. How many of you want to see the light of God's Holy Spirit shine through your life where people are looking at you just like they did with Moses and said, whoa, what's going on? There's some glory on that man or woman. He says, this is how it happens, through correct fasting. And your healing shall spring up speedily. How many of you need healing in your body? How many of you need healing in your mind? How many of you need healing in your soul and in the memory and regret of the past? It says, your righteousness shall go before you and the glory of the Lord shall be your guard. What he's saying is that when we have a lifestyle of aligning ourselves with God and especially through prayer and fasting, we don't have to be worried about what's going on. God's saying, I got you six. I got your back. Don't worry about it. Keep your eyes straight ahead and keep walking. Because a lot of times, you know, we're, we're, someone might come up against me. So we're, we'll take a couple steps in the Lord and then we stop and look back. Should I go? Okay, no, I'm going to. And then, and then God's saying, stop looking back to what has been. Stop looking at your failures. Stop looking at even your successes. Paul even says, look, I don't pretend that I've attained perfection, but this one thing I do understand. I let go of what's behind and I reach to what's ahead. How many of you would like to be free from the tyranny of always feeling like you have to look behind your back? Financially, emotionally, relationally, Verse 9, then you shall call and the Lord will answer. See, we serve a God that doesn't just throw a book at you and says, figure it out. We serve a God who listens and hears. And it says, not only will the Lord hear, but when you call to the Lord, he will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, of speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom shall be as the noonday. If you want to know how to break a spirit of heaviness, of depression, what God is saying is get your head out of your own stuff. Start looking at how you can help other people. Look, I, have, I suffered for years with chronic depression. I understand the differences between the physical, chemical, uh, uh, physiological aspects of depression. Sometimes they're, they're brain chemicals that go weird where you feel depressed. I also understand the emotional, mental, and spiritual aspects of depression. And what's really horrible is when all those things get together and they get intertwined. And it doesn't matter if, if you are dealing with depression today, whether this be physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, you, you deal with them in different ways. But what God is saying is how you get out of depression and a spirit of oppression and heaviness. He says, stop focusing on what's wrong and how you feel. 
Jesus did not feel like going to the cross. And in fact, he went to his father. And this is something that still theologically blows my mind, that the word of God was in the garden. His will was out of alignment with his father's will, yet he was without sin. He says, I don't want to go to the cross, but he was still submitted. The Bible says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the shame and died the death of the cross. Therefore, God has given him the name which is above every name. You know, a lot of times our, our frustration and depression can even come from, when's it going to be my time? I've been, I've been working and working and going through and God, you know, and, and, and Peter writes about this and he says, humble yourselves under the hand of the Almighty and in due time he will raise you up. Well, great, that doesn't sound that encouraging. You're telling me, what, what does that mean? What that means is stop worrying about you. Let God worry about you and just say, God, what have you put in my hand and how can I be a blessing to other people? I'm not saying you need to sell all your stuff and, and give it all away, but what I am saying is that God is, is saying that one of the main purposes of a fast is not so you can go to God and say how great and, and holy you are because you fasted, and God, I feel so bad, so you have to move in my life. It, we are to fast so that we can stop being so selfish. Most of the problems that we encounter in our lives is because we want what we want and we're not seeking God, period. And even when we're in alignment, we go through stuff because other people are selfish. And what God is saying is, in a fast, get your head out of the muck and the mire of your situation. Start looking to me. Let praise come out of your mouth. I will give you the oil of joy and gladness for your despair, but you have to look up. Get your eyes and your mouth trained on me, and then look for opportunities to be a blessing to other people. You know, if your routine at work is to buy lunch, go ahead and buy lunch, just don't eat it. Buy it for your coworker. That's, that's exactly what he's saying. Look for, I mean, look, there's need all around us. It doesn't take a lot. And it doesn't mean that you're just giving everything you have to anybody you see. You need to have some discretion and discernment and wisdom about that. But the whole point is that we, are in a fast, it is so easy to make it all about us. And here's one thing I want to challenge you. If you decide that you want to go on this fast with us as a church, figure out what you want to do before the fast starts and then just do it. And stop worrying about what you can and cannot have. Make it as simple as you possibly can and make sure that it actually costs you something. And then keep it simple and just do it. Because fasting is not about, I mean, I've, I've been on fast where it's the only thing we're talking about is what we can't have. There was another group of people in the Bible who liked to talk about what they couldn't have. They were on the way to the promised land, but God put them in a forced fast in the wilderness. And they said, oh, I want the garlic and the onions, and I, I can't have it, and now my appetites are, are getting challenged, and I want to go back to that thing over here. But God is saying, look, you are going through this wilderness period. I'm not bringing you here to kill you. I'm trying to transform your mind and your heart and for you to see that I am a miracle-working God. I just caused water to come out of a rock. So if water can flow from a rock, I am your father. I will feed you. I will give you water to drink. I will provide for you. Stop being so afraid. And even in Jesus' greatest message, the Sermon on the Mount, he says, do not worry about what you're going to eat, about what you're going to wear. Don't worry about what's happening tomorrow. And the famous verse, Matthew 6, 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. It doesn't just mean, uh, you know, God is holy and so we got to do right things. That's part of it. But the word righteous means to perform the function of something's design. So a brick in a wall is righteous because it's designed to be there. A brick on the ground is unrighteous and it could be something that somebody trips over. And so God, in his righteousness, let's look at what he does. 
He loves the world, so he gave his son, that he is our provider, protector. He is the one who gives us wisdom and strength. He gives us the Holy Spirit to bring counseling and comfort. And what God is saying, when we are to seek the kingdom of God, that means we're aligned with his order, his laws, his rules, his, and, and that, that, uh, that we would be a people who come into alignment with his word, but that he says, and his righteousness, so go do what I'm telling you to do with the right attitude. Here's what God is saying. Love God. Love people. It's extremely easy to say. It's extremely difficult to do. And we need the supernatural power of God's grace. We need his Holy Spirit. Another thing I want to add about this fast. Many times we fast for 37 seconds and because the heaven didn't open and we didn't get this, you know, an angel talking to us, um, you know, and, and you know, that th we're like, okay, I just don't want to do this fast. I know people have had really amazing experiences in the midst of a fast, and I've definitely had my share of revelations during fasts, but most of the time, my experience, and as I talk to other people, this is their experience as well, that the answers don't come during a fast. It's as we are faithful to the fast, the, the refreshing and the answers and the revelation comes after the fast. Is there a biblical model for this? Yes. The wilderness testing of Jesus. It says that he didn't eat anything for 40 days and he was hungry. Yeah, you think? And then when he was weak, at his most vulnerable point, and he was hungry, he was, he was, he was hangry, Satan made a mistake. He thought, I'm going to get him at his weakest. It's like, you got the word of God when he was hangry. He's going to kick your face in. Don't. And look, Satan's a fool. How are you going to come at the word with the word and think you're going to win? I just, there's, anyway. And so Jesus, during this fast, it didn't say Satan tempted him all 40 days. Satan stepped back and watched and waited until he was vulnerable. He waited all 40 days till he was at his weakest point. Then Satan came. And so Jesus then used the word to push back the enemy. James says that we are to submit to God, resist the enemy, and he will flee. And this is absolutely part of a fast, of learning how that process works in our life in a practical way. And then, at the end of the temptation, after Jesus was successful, then it says angels came to minister to him. I remember there was um, a fast that, that my wife, myself, and another friend of ours uh, went on, and we actually all got matching tattoos afterward. Um, but it was an extremely difficult fast. I, I can't speak for the rest of them, but I know for me that was my first 40-day fast, and it was difficult. And we had it set so it was progressively more difficult. Like the first week was no meat. But by the week six, it was just water. And it was at the point where we went to sleep and I was dreaming about eating, and then I woke up repenting. <laughs> <laughs> Lord, I'm sorry. And I'm like, God, there's no food. <laughs> Then I was sad because there was no food, but then I was happy that I didn't break the fast. So I'm just like, I just have all this emotion. <laughs> but at the end of this 40-day fast, we went to Tennessee to see Lou Engle. The culminating event of this, uh, what they called the call, was they said if right now the Holy Spirit is moving through the auditorium and there is a spirit of martyrdom, if you feel like you are called to lay down your life for the gospel, stand up. And if this is not you, stay sitting down. Basically, the only people that are standing up is the Holy Spirit. He's basically yanking you up. And before he was even done speaking, I saw myself, my wife, and my friend, or she wasn't my wife at the time, but uh, Pastor Adina and my friend on our feet, and I, we felt the Holy Spirit hit us so hard. And there was, I can't even put it into words, something that happened there that day where it says, God, no matter what it costs, no matter where I go, no matter what you say, my answer is yes. I know I'm going to mess up. I'm going to trip. I'm going to blow it. I'm going to fall short so many times. But Lord, if you're willing still, knowing all of that because you do, to still call me to walk with you, then it doesn't matter what the price is. I will pay it. It doesn't matter how far it is. I will go. God, I'm saying yes to you that even if no one ever takes my physical life for claiming Jesus, that I will be a living sacrifice 
Christ today. I'm going to die to the, the, the influence of the world that I'm going to resist being conformed to the image and pattern of everybody else that the enemy is encapsulating in his mold, that Jesus, I want you to live on the inside of me. It was in this spirit that, that Paul wrote that to, to die or to live is Christ, but to die is gain. And then right after that, I said, now, the last thing that we want to do is there's some people here that want to actually get married. And so they had like four or five uh, marriages. They had a wedding ceremony. But in that, the Holy Spirit came in a way that, that I have never experienced before or since. He didn't come as judge. He didn't come as, you know, it's not the fire falling. He came as the bridegroom. He came as the lover of our souls. And so as we made that declaration of saying, God, all I am is yours, then God said, all right, then all I am is yours. In the Song of Solomon, it is uh, Solomon writing to his wife, but it is also a picture of God writing to us. He says, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. See, it is in this heart that James writes in James chapter 4, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Therefore, wash your hands, you sinners, and cleanse your hearts, you double-minded. What James is saying, he is holy, and he is calling you to be holy, and you can't do it yourself. God knows that, but as you draw near, you bring your hands up to him in worship, in prayer, in getting into his word, that yes, we do have to try. The struggle is real. The Bible says we do have to resist the enemy. There is work in discipleship. Anyone told you any differently, they're selling you snake oil. But God gives us grace to do what we could not do before. See, the kingdom of God is not a self-help plan. God is not saying, well, you just need to change for the better. He's saying, no, I want to transform you into my image. I want you to reflect my glory. I want you to be who I've created you to be. And when you are, it points to me. I'm your father, and I want you to look like it. Again, verse 10, it says, If you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then your light shall arise in the darkness, and your gloom shall be as the noonday. Verse 11, and the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong. You shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. How many of you would have places in your life where you, you felt that you had purpose and destiny, but then something happened? And then what you thought was going to be this big, beautiful castle in your life is now just a bunch of rubble. See, what God is saying is that when we align ourselves with him, it's not, yeah, he starts out with tell my people their transgressions, but it ends with walking in glory. And it's not just from here on. He says, I will even go back to the pile of rubble. I will show you what was me and what wasn't. The stuff that wasn't me, we're going to bury that and leave that behind. But the stuff that was me, I can go back and actually repair and bring it to your present and to your future. See, one of the names of Jesus that I love is the repairer of the breach. There have been times in the wall of my life where God has given me uh, borders and boundaries, where he's promised me security and provision, where through my own sin and rebellion, I've broken down the wall in my own life. See, Jesus doesn't just call us to get behind the wall. He says even when our sin blows it up, he comes as the repairer of the breach. My Lord. Yeah, I was preaching the next verse. I didn't even realize it. It says, your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall rise up, raise up the foundations of many generations. See, fasting is one of the ways that we heal generational brokenness. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, a restorer of streets to dwell in. 
If you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways, or seeking your own pleasure, or talking idly. Now, is God saying that you can't have any form of pleasure on a fast? Now, what he's saying is that you are seeking the pleasure or filling the need of other people. The reason why we fast is get in alignment with God, and what God is all about is others. Then you shall take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And so as we are on this fast, and if you're out there and you're saying, you know, I, I don't know about fasting, I don't think I can do it, it's, you know, it's, it's not healthy, I've heard somebody say, which that's just factually incorrect, um, but Whatever your reason to not do it, I encourage you, listen to the Lord. I encourage you to try. And here's the thing. When you fast, especially when you don't have that muscle, that discipline, again, you go into the gym and you're starting to lift. No one starts benching 400 pounds. No one can deadlift 600 just like on their first try. You do that, you will die. And so with fasting, if you do not have that discipline, then make it something simple and attainable for you. And also listen to the Lord, because there have been times when he said, son, I want you to go on a water fast. And I'm like, you know, I don't think my discipline, son, go on a water fast. My grace is sufficient. Yes, sir. And see, in those times when God has told me to fast and how to fast, it has actually, I don't want to say easier, but he's given me a grace that there have been other times when I decided to fast and it wasn't time and it was something small that I was given up, but that was like the craziest thing ever. And see, human nature is so funny. You, if you decide you want to fast, it would be like, I hate black licorice. I'm going to fast black licorice. The second you start the fast, your brain starts, how can I get some black licorice? Maybe it's not that bad. How can I just get a little, just little taste right here? That's not like in the mouth. Maybe I just smell it. <laughs> here, you eat this and let me smell your breath. Breathe on me. I don't even like black licorice. And that's what a fast is all about. It's about wrestling with yourself with God. It's about wrestling with the enemy with God. It's even about wrestling with God and your preconceived ideas of who he is and allowing him to come and touch your hip where you thought you were walking strong and then all of a sudden you realize that you are humbled under God's mighty hand. See, Jacob, when his name was changed to Israel, the Lord touched his hip. See, he was walking strong, manipulating people everywhere he went. But God says, I need to make you weak in your flesh so that you can be strong in your spirit. You have an entire generation on the inside of you. And I can't have you walking in this pride and rebellion thinking that you have done it. But here's the thing. I would rather walk with my own limp before the Lord than have him need to come touch me in that way. I've gone through breaking seasons. And the Lord says, it's better if you choose to humble yourself. He says, because if you follow me, at some point you have to learn humility. This is not optional. And either you will learn it willingly, or I will allow you to go through certain circumstances that will bring a humbling and a crushing. But even in that, I'm there, I'm with you, and it's not for your destruction, it's for your good. Because I am the God who heals and restores you. And sometimes God healing you means he needs to break you first. Following, you know, you've heard me say this. Being a disciple of Jesus, it won't cost you a lot. It will cost you everything. But he gives you everything in return. <laughs>